Subscribe to The Honest Critique for current affairs, movie, book, and product reviews. Also, make sure you press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the video series are solely those of the individuals and do not necessarily represent those of The Honest Critique and its employees. The following video contains strong language which may be offensive to some viewers. Viewer discretion advised. So hello and welcome to another episode of Security Intelligence and Terrorism series. Today we have Rafiq Sultani with us. He's the director of Rand Center for Asia Specific Policy, a senior economist at the Rand Corporation. and a professor at the party rand graduate school thank you so much sir for taking your time and uh, being on the show thank you ratnadeep it's a pleasure so sir before we start with some specific question uh, if you could tell us why is the asia uh, pacific policy for us so important at the point of time why is uh, every country uh, around the west looking around the asia pacific policy at this point of time Yeah no that's a great question that wasn't the case even 20 years ago uh and so it's changed a lot in the last uh, last two decades particularly in the last decade you know until the year 2000 uh, so there was there were countries in 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 asia pacific which were doing well uh you know for example china of course had started to do very well um then japan was there but its share of world gdp was quite small now if you look at china for example its share of world gdp you know right all the way till 1990 before it joined the you know, before it opened up was about 2 and 1/2% or less than that and even when it joined the wto it was still about 3% or so so at that share of gdp and of course india and all were much smaller um you know the total for all of the asia asian countries was maybe of the order of 6% 7% of world gdp so it didn't really matter so much they didn't exercise much power they couldn't afford to spend too much on the military uh and in fact uh, the us was keen that the asia pacific open up much more so as you know one of the things that was done was to get china into the wto the world trade organization something that china had wanted for a while but had been resisted by other countries and the us championed that cause heavily i think they didn't realize how much china would benefit from it china from being you know as i mentioned 2001 you know less than 5% of world gdp is now 15% as of 2019 2020 and this year it will be even more so it'll be about 16 17% so that's why you know so that's one reason uh, china being the main one asean countries southeast asia there's not been much change it's still below 5% of gdp most of the countries within asean are still quite closely allied with the united states anyway uh the other countries that matter in in asia really japan If you want to count Australia as a um, Asia Pacific power, middle power, of course, Korea, they're all closely aligned with the U.S. Um, and then you have India and two other and one other country that matters really in the in the scenario. In the case of the country that matters a lot in recent years, it's North Korea. So you know, so North Korea again till two decades ago, before it was named as part of the axis of evil. uh by president bush in 2001 after the world trade center bombing uh was not considered a threat in fact the, the us had come out of a long agreement with north korea that still had not been declared dead and you know it was a 1994 agreed framework but that changed when north korea exploded a nuclear device uh, with the failure of the six party talks so that suddenly became important particularly as they developed a ballistic missile technology to reach the us and then india india um started to grow well in the early 2000s and by 2010 looked like it was going to start making a significant mark on the world stage 
Uh, it's still not there yet. It's still below, well below 5% of world GDP, well below. So, you know, but still it's of interest to the US because it's growing and it's large. So that's broadly the reason why what was not on the radar screen is now on the radar screen for the US. Okay. So uh, uh, when we look at China for a moment and look at some of the, uh, uh, look at the influence that it has been able to assert over the last few years. Uh, and if you look at the US perspective, that's why I have, I'll ask two questions. One is about the Belt and Road Initiative, which you have closely observed uh, of how uh, China has been asserting influence through that initiative and expand to 65 countries on three continents. And the other is the uh, Development Bank, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, which consists of 14 G20 members. How does US look at these two uh, assertive policies of China? The Belt and Road Initiative and the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, right? The AIIB. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, so I think one has to look at it in terms of how to exert influence. So from the United States point of view, when it sort of thought about how it would exert influence, it thought, thought of two things that it would do. And it was a long-term strategy put in place after World War II. The first thing it said that it would do was to set up a number of global institutions uh, which would, through which it would exercise control, but which would also bring in other partners and allies to work with it so that the US could keep them allied with itself as it exerted influence. It would, they would, you know, the other countries would bring in resources as well, so everything wouldn't be burdened on the US. So the institutions that were set up were primarily around the United Nations, you know, and its organizations like the World Health Organization, um, you know, the Bretton Woods uh, production of the International Monetary Fund, IMF, and the World Bank, and then later on the General Agreement on Tariff and Trade, and which became the WTO. So th with these institutions, the US tried to control socioeconomic development globally, uh, set the rules of the game, and then you had um, uh, the, uh, the other part of the US strategy, which was to have bilateral or regional alliances for military purposes. So NATO on one side, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization for Europe. Um, it proved difficult to have too many alliances in Asia, but still the US has alliances with individual countries, uh, Singapore, Thailand, Korea, Japan, Philippines, so five countries. Uh, but what it did was it promoted ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. And, there, and that was it's designed to try and bat, combat Soviet influence during the Cold War and be the U.S.'s security arm. Uh, with China and India, uh, things were slightly different in terms of security alliances. India was still part of the Soviet-aligned bloc inclined to join. So actually, India stayed out of any alliance with the US, even though the US was extremely keen. Um, and then you had China, which it was too large, it refused to join any bloc, it wanted to play off the Soviet Union versus the United States. So occasionally, it would side with one, occasionally with the other. For example, the Vietnam War, China played an active role in support of the United States. But in other areas around the world, uh, Africa, um, Cuba, and so on, its policy was against that of the US. So that was the US strategy. Now, China has taken a different view. One is it recognizes that the age of building military alliances is probably over. You know, it's countries like that are friendly to it, for example, Indonesia, are still not going to sign a military alliance with China. So that's one. Second is its ability to influence uh, governance systems, you know, like the US can promote democracy because it itself is a democracy. But China cannot promote authoritarianism because even though it is an authoritarian society, because that won't sell, you know. So they decide not to do that. They don't really care about the regime they're dealing with. They're completely agnostic to regime. So they realize that the only way they can have influence is through the economic level. So the economic lever that they came up with was to set up, um, to participate more actively in 
social and economic development organizations such as the World Bank, WHO, etc. But also where they face blockages, uh, they would do their own. So, for example, they were keen to increase their say in the World Bank and offered to buy extra shares to reflect their share of GDP. But the US said no, it was worried about China's influence. So then China had no option but to try and set up its own bank, the AIIB. With regard to infrastructure, that was a genuinely uh, a very innovative approach by China. You know, they realized that if you if you invest in a country's infrastructure, that that lasts for a long time. You know, you build a dam, a power plant, a road. That's not going to go away when the government changes, and you've got a signed contract. So it gives you influence for a long time, even through regime change in those target countries. So that's what we've seen happen. You know, Malaysia went through a change. Initially, they made a fuss about the previous government's PRI investment. Then they came on board. Sri Lanka and Matri Pelasar, Sir Sena went through a change of government. More pro India made a little bit of a fuss and quietly got in line because China was doing good things for them. I mean, these are actually big um, investments that are transformative for the country. So they really help the country. Uh, so, you know, China sacrificed its own resources for its own people. After all, it's still not a rich country to put in place the Belt and Road Initiative that would help other countries. And that has given it a lot of influence. So that's the reason for the Chinese strategy. And it's one that the U.S. is finding very difficult to challenge because the U.S. doesn't want to put in that sort of money. You know, China has put in several hundred billion dollars into this. The U.S. has no tradition of giving its own money away to anyone. It, if it has to give money, it gives it for security purposes, not for a development aid, particularly in the last few decades. So, so unless that changes, uh, China has a pretty good, good opportunity under the BRI to exert influence. So two of the major challenges that U.S. is facing, especially uh, with statistics that by 2030, uh, that China might overtake U.S. as uh, an economic part, as the world's largest economic part. Uh, one of them is the military uh, budget. Uh, it, the, it's on the flux right now. And uh, what is happening is with the defense cuts, it becomes important that U.S. cannot spend as much as it wants to on the Indo-Pacific region. And the other, you rightly mentioned about uh, regional cooperation. How can U.S., uh, because a lot of these countries, are, whether it's Asian countries or whether it's uh, in uh, the South Asian countries, a lot of them are actually a part of the BRI project. Uh, and linking with U.S. might be like anti-China somewhere. How can U.S. make multilateralism work in the sector? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I, I don't think we know the answer to that. The U.S. would like to, you know, build security relations with the Asian countries, but very few are willing to do it and sacrifice their relationship with China. Because end of the day there's a shortage of capital and very few countries have surplus capital. The US is, a, by the way, the largest generator of surplus capital in the world, even today. But it does, just doesn't have a policy to invest those in poor countries. It mostly invests, you know, if you look at FDI statistics from the US to other countries, it largely goes to Western Europe uh, and other developed countries. But that's where the markets are large you know, and much more predictable, low risk compared with investing in a project in Zambia or in Ecuador where the government's failing, there's corruption, you know, Lao, Cambodia. I mean, there's so many countries where these are fragile institutions. So, so you know, uh, it's hard for the US to compete on that side. So using alliances is its best uh, strategy. I think the question worth asking is, is it too late? Uh, because by now, China has a firm foothold in most of the countries that are of interest to the U.S., you know, Indonesia, Korea, maybe with the exception of Japan and India, um, which, you know, are in Japan because it itself is a capital surplus country, so it hasn't needed any funding from China. India because of what's happened on the borders. But at the end of the day, these are not yet ready for prime time, you know. So the U.S. will have to play the leading role in, in building the alliance. You know, what it would like is an alliance where 
like the e like nato where the european countries pay their full share they take some leadership role as well uh, that's not the case with with asian countries particularly india and japan so um, my question is in two parts one is why uh, for all the people uh, uh, viewers who watch this uh, if you could uh, briefly touch upon why is there a need to balance power in the uh, asia pacific region why is there a need to contain uh, china as a rising power and second option is i'll come to uh, india specific question a bit later but can the elephant and the dragon rise together question of why you should have a balance of power in asia is a good one uh, logically there should be a balance within asia that asia finds the us is not an asian power and so why why is it interested in in asia so the us interest is long term it's economic because asia is still the most dynamic region in the world um and second is military you know these as asia gets richer its capacity to absorb sales of weapons from the us to these countries is going to grow pretty large it's already very large if you look at just japan for example and korea and you know the other countries where it's allied but it's huge if you include india and uh, you know uh, the other countries of the southeast asian southeast asia so why should we have a balance of power it's really from the us's point of view uh, to be there for the pie as it gets very large in some cases uh, now in the case of china and north korea this uh, different situation the us still believes that north korea is a threat because it has nuclear weapons that can reach the united states and it was it's worried about that so it wants to be in, involved to pre- prevent against that interestingly if you talk to south koreans they are not worried about any such threat from north korea so they feel that the us is just over overstating it for its own purposes but whatever it is you know it's there and then you look at um, you know the, the in the absence of uh, china the us would not really have had any issues um but with china there and having declared it a strategic competitor it's pretty much pushed china into the race so china was has always been talking the talk and you, if you read their their policy documents there's no sense of uh, a great power race that they wanted to engage in absent the us forcing them to do it by upping the ante you know for example the south china sea issue we can talk about that, that a bit later but there's a long history there which shows that the race was to a large extent created by the us you know over there china is there it's a player but it would not have been an issue either in the south china or the east china seas without the us playing a significant role so this raises a question that you raised of um, can india and china the dragon and the elephant or the elephant and the dragon uh, manage to coexist and even to cooperate i think uh, interestingly india's approach to this prior to the uh, you know the ladakh intrusion was pretty much along the lines of china is a great power the us is a great power we want to work with both you know in terms of trade and fdi both are going to be really important to us in terms of ability to implement large manufacturing related projects or infrastructure projects like power projects railroads and so on china is going to be far more important for us than the us so with that thinking um, in mind on one side and the other thinking in mind being also that india has ambitions to be a great power now if the us succeeds in knocking china off the number 2 pedestal it also means that there's no role for india as number 3 because us is never going to allow india to come up to number 2 if it's not going to allow china so in some ways indian policy makers welcome china's rise provided it proved provided no threat to india as a counterbalance to the us saying yeah you know it gives us a chance to be number 3 but i think the ladakh uh, incidents really raises the question as to whether the two countries can live in peace 
Now, you know, if you read the literature on both sides, I think there's a fairly balanced story that comes out. It's not that China is the aggressor, et cetera, et cetera, you know, and we can go into that history if you want. Uh, but uh, I think there were issues on both sides. Um, they sorted it out for the moment, which is great news. Let's see. I mean, now I think the ball is in India's court, see whether it relaxes some of the strictures that it had put in on Chinese investment in infrastructure, software companies, and so on. And whether that procedure, that process will move ahead or not. Uh, I meanwhile, under the Biden administration, I think the US is putting a lot of pressure on India to not come close to China. Um, and but you know, India has its own policy. It's a great country on its own right. It really doesn't need to follow either the China line or the US line and can be an independent power. But you know, let's see. I mean, I think there are issues and complications within India that are always going to make it difficult. I mean, to give you an example, China has border disputes, has had land border disputes since World War II with 16 countries that it borders. It has signed deals with 14 of them. So only two countries remain on the unsettled disputes list, India and Bhutan. And Bhutan is largely because of India, because India would not let Bhutan sign a deal that Bhutan wanted to sign. So it's really with India. And that makes you realize that, you know, there are, probably there are, both parties are involved in this issue. It's not just a Chinese problem. Yeah. Well, uh a pretty straightforward question. Uh, would it be surprising at this point if China's comparative rise were to make India edgy and inclined to call in its hedge in terms of its relation with the US? Yeah, in a sense, the uh, same sort of thinking. I think that you know, China's much because partly because of US competition, China is racing ahead in terms of military capability at a pace that India, because of lack of resources, uh, will not be able to match for many years to come. So the gap in terms of military secure capability, which was not there, such a big gap as the economic gap, is actually going to become similar to the economic gap between the two countries. And that's a, you know, a source of worry for India. What it, what it means is that, let's say in Ladakh, Basically, the Chinese have withdrawn back to some earlier positions. But really, if they want to, they can go back anytime they want. Because they have the military capability to do that. Now, obviously, there are red lines created by the nuclear umbrella that each country has on itself. Uh, but um, absent that issue, you know, as long as you don't cross red lines, one of the things that China has demonstrated with the Ladakh incident is it can capture Indian territory when it wants to. Um, now, I know this is disputed, so maybe I, I'm just giving partial story here, but that's my impression that before the pullback, the Chinese had territory of about at least 50 square miles that they had taken over from what area was controlled by India. So, you know, um, that makes it, the issue is that India needs to be concerned about China China will, has proven with other countries like Korea that it was not has. At the same time needs to work with it. So I think the interesting question for me is, is what is the role of the US here? You know, and I think uh, in the, in the U.S. is going to push hard, but I will find that pushing Japan and Australia in the Quad is far, far easier than pushing India. You know, as someone bureaucrat told me, nothing empties a room of senior bureaucrats faster than an American diplomat telling them to to cut down on their relations with China. Yeah. Uh so a little bit coming to India and its uh, Indo-Pacific policy that it has uh, shaped. It was laid initially to actually come in terms and shape of policy. Even right now as well, we have seen very few policies have been there to tackle China in the region. Well, there has been a higher investment in the naval power in the last few uh, 
uh, years, uh, it has started uh, the Lucas policy and uh, the excise in Milan. Uh, but however, we have seen that very uh, little things have been done over the last few years in terms of specific policy. Why is it so? I think it's resource driven. If you look at the Malabar exercises, hardly anyone showed up. You know, there were like eight ships from other countries, for for other countries. So, you know, these things are ex extremely expensive to organize. And India is right now economically still trying to recover from the pandemic. So, its ability to develop and exercise military power, whether it's land, sea, or air, is pretty limited. I think. So, you know, in that situation, you know, it's got Pakistan to manage on the Kashmir side. It's now spending more on the China side. You know, I mean, I see a massive resource constraint as being the real issue for India for the next several years. Yeah. Uh, so, in, in, if... If looking at uh, an Indian perspective of uh, Chinese aggression in the South China Sea and its implication for the Indo-Pacific region, and we have also seen the string of pearls and uh, China exploring the Humbantota port and the Gwadar port, uh, should India be concerned about this aggression transpiring to the Indo-Pacific region? Well, it's not aggression as such. It's You're right, there is a... A strategy, a strategy in place to to build uh, networks of ports. It's not just Gwadar and Hambantota, but it's also Colombo port. It's also, uh, you know, in Laos there's a port, in Cambodia there's a port, in Myanmar there's a port, in Bangladesh there's a port near Chittagong. So you know, there are about nine or ten ports. If you look at the Belt and Road map. You can see that very clearly that it starts from the Straits of Malacca right across the Indian Ocean and ends at Djibouti in, in Af East Africa. So, you know, uh, now should India be concerned? Um, other than Djibouti, there is, no, um, there is no military aspect to these ports. At, at least at the moment, there is no military aspect and explicitly written into the contract for each of these ports is that this, these will be commercially uh, driven ports. Now, you know, one could always say that this, that might change. So if, for example, in Pakistan, which is, you know, very close to China, if the port was to be desired by the Chinese for use and for military purposes, maybe they would allow it. It's not that simple, you know, when you have basing requirements, those are very big investments. It's not that you send a ship in from of Chinese PLA and Navy and, you know, and that's a military use. To have refueling, you know, basing, I mean, these are huge investments that can't be hidden. There's no sign of that yet. I would think that for the moment, China doesn't see India as an opportunity to encircle. It will much rather look for better relations on the trade and investment side with India. So I'm not seeing that as a real concern, you know. I've read about concerns of string of pearls forever. But where's the evidence, you know, uh, that other than trade? Now, on the other hand, I feel that the trade side uh, is a real worry for India. You know, if why should Colombo port do 80% of his business on transshipment, basically take big ships come there and then unload and send stuff to India. India should have its own ports to do exactly the same thing. Why is it that the Indian strategy, which includes giving it out to Dubai port operators so that there wouldn't be any money going out from India, why are those strategies failing? I think it's more on the economic side that I would worry about India versus China in, as far as South Asia is concerned. And if you look at the South China Sea, I mean, India's made some statements. I don't think anyone in the world other than the Indian media and Indian politician takes them seriously. They are not a player in the South China Sea and never will be. So I would discount that completely. The South China Sea is basically 
an issue made up of nothing. You know, it's a bunch of islands which have been declared by the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea to be uninhabitable. In other words, they do not offer any uh, hope of being having their own economic zone around them. So they offer no benefit in economic terms to anyone. Developing them is just a cost. There's no return because they're basically uninhabitable. There's no advantage to putting a military base in the middle of the ocean when your mainland is just a few hundred miles away and you can do it much better. That makes a difference of an hour or so. You know, so the South China Sea is just a made up issue. Uh, it has absolutely no relevance. And actually till, till 1995 or so, it was dead to everyone. I mean, no one raised it, There's the whole history behind it that the UN would decide what to do about those islands. And then Vietnam started grabbing them. And Vietnam's land grab um, sparked interest of the other countries, Brunei, Malaysia, Taiwan, and China, and the Philippines. And each one started grabbing all the China didn't begin in earnest till 2012, by which time all the good ones were gone. So right now, out of the about 60 largest islands in the Spratly Islands, None of which islands again, by the way, in terms of habitability. But out of the 60, about 30 are with Vietnam. China only has seven. So, you know, it's, it's just, a, I think, a story for American security interests to really create the issue of their interest as an Asia-Pacific power, but no relevance to India. Yeah. So, uh, this thought comes to my mind of how India, a few years back, was a major power in South uh, Asia. It controlled, uh, so, I mean, it had bi good bilateral relations with uh, the countries like, uh, for example, Bangladesh, Nepal, uh, Sri Lanka. Oh, and is it because of in, uh, a hegemonic power that India was becoming and uh, starts becoming dysfunctional uh, over a period of time? India lost some of its uh, influence in the region. You know, there are two ways you can, in, when, you have, when you have borders with countries, there are two ways to exercise power. I've always found, you know, someone in Nepal, when I was doing some research on regionalism, used this phrase that India is a big brother, it needs to be a big sister. You know, what he meant was uh, today's Women's Day, so it's a good day to celebrate the achievements of women. What he meant was that um, you know you, you can you can tell a country what to do, and say these are my expectations of you, or you can say let's work together and both of us will give up something to get something. So the big brother versus big sister. So for example, if you look at Sri Lanka, the sport project that recently Rajapaksa government, which is no friend of India, decided to not award to the Indo-Japanese consortium. Now, what was India's response? India's response was, we expect our fair share. So that's what a big brother would say, right? A, a big sister would say, you know, let's chat about it and say, how can we cooperate with you to make this happen? So I think there's an attitudinal issue, which is nothing to do with this decade or earlier. It's always been a problem with Indian foreign policy. And it's very visible from the formation of SARC uh, when, you know, there were so many things that South could have done, but the only thing they agreed on was on poverty alleviation, which was really not a co cooperation issue at all. It was a country specific issue. So SARC ended up being a failure by definition from day one. And to, I mean, it's not India wasn't alone at fault. Pakistan very much had a role in it as well. But India is the lead player, shares the largest uh, percentage of responsibility for that failure. And it's been a constant irritation to someone like me who sees the opportunity that India could have to be a solid force for good uh, and from a from a cooperative basis not being able to achieve that otherwise by now you know India would have helped transform the whole region instead you have India doing well sometimes and not doing well sometimes but has no connection with how the other countries do you know whereas all should move together that said, India has spent a lot of effort on improving ties with Bangladesh. And that has paid off. Uh, Sheikh Hasina is, you know, has consistently been a friend of India's. Again, she also needs money. It's a poor country. It's a corrupt country. She needs funding and China is giving her that. So she's taking it where she gets it. 
but I think Indian policy where, you know, the giving up of land for land, exactly what a big sister should have done, it did. And that put in base a long-term basis for a good, good relations. So I think that's the problem and that's the opportunity. So this is the last question before I wrap up. Uh, so I was reading this Congress uh, report and uh, uh, the research report, and I was uh, looking at this question that they have posed, and I thought it was very important to end it with asking this of with the Pakistan angle of how U.S. government should approach the India, Pakistan, and China strategic triangles. Should Washington seek to balance its ties with India and Pakistan, especially uh, right after uh, the uh, withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan? Uh, should Washington think to uh, have it uh, rethink its post 9 11 alliance with Pakistan, given that it's fr frustrated with Islamabad's counterterrorism efforts? And should it also try to mediate, uh, as Donald Trump was saying, uh, the Indo Pakistan dispute, whether, it, uh, whether it's with, regarding Kashmir or whether it's with any other proxy wars that Pakistan has been pushing? Yeah, I think Pakistan would welcome that, but it's too late from an Indian point of view. That moment of when the US and the UN could have done something probably passed many, many decades ago. And, um, you know, Kashmir, therefore, can, will continue to be an India-Pakistan problem that will not get solved. Uh, so that, unfortunately, is a problem we have to live with. And there's nothing the US can do about that. Now, that said, from an Afghanistan point of view, there is potential for cooperation. Um, I mean, fundamentally, there's no disagreement on the objectives of India, Pakistan, and the United States about the outcomes of Afghanistan. The problem is the Afghans themselves are so weak and so corrupt that, and that they are unable to forge a solution on their own. Now, there's no reason why they should need any country to find, handle them through the process. They need aid to recover, but right now the issue is that of security. Why is it that they on their own steam cannot figure out what to do? It's not that um, there are these porous borders and Pakistan keeps pouring money into Taliban and all Taliban has bases in Pakistan. All that is there, but the, fundamentally the issue is an unwillingness to adjust to the two of the two different camps. Now, the U.S. is trying to force the issue under Donald Trump, and it used a lot of help from Pakistan to build relations with the Taliban, and that helped Pakistan. But, you know, Pakistan-U.S. relations have always been, they're long-term, but they're long-term tactical. There's nothing strategic about their connections. And the U.S. never viewed Pakistan as a strategic partner, even potentially, whereas it does view India as a strategic partner. So, now, in that mix, of course, China has traditionally had a hands-off role in, China, in Afghanistan. Uh, and, you know, it could have played a lot of mischief in that area. It didn't do anything. It was not really interested. It was focusing on its issues at home. Now what's happened is with the Belt and Road Initiative in Pakistan, Pakistan has started to develop a bit and is now eyeing the opportunity to, of using its uh, infrastructure under the Belt and Road Initiative to, which is called CPEC in Pakistan, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, to build, um, to build something in Afghanistan, build railways, build roads, build power plants. So it, it's suggesting to China that let's use your money, your technology, your implementation skills uh, but we will do the facilitation with Afghanistan. And China has not said no to that, you know. It sees some, it has some interest in that from a trade point of view. Let's see where that goes, you know. It's going to be very hard, I think, until Afghanistan can sort out its internal political and security issues. I don't think these projects are a go. But questions, you know, I think if that happens and China and Pakistan move ahead, that would... Uh, raise a question for India, does it, does it try and join these initiatives or come up with parallel ones? Anytime you do parallel ones, you need funding, which India doesn't have, and which the US is not willing to put. Maybe a third country like Japan will do it, but it's pretty unlikely. So I think it's, it's a difficult situation. Okay. 
So before we wrap up, uh, this is what we generally do because our, most of our audience consists of young uh, pe- uh, young people uh, who watches this interview. If you could give us like a couple of books or three books that young people should read uh, on this issue. Sure, sure. Yeah, I recommend a couple of books. So one is by Ching Kwan Lee, C K Lee, which is about uh, Chinese investments in Africa, but focus on Zambia and you can just uh, go to your site Amazon or whatever, wherever you buy your books and look at look up CK Lee and China and Zambia and you'll find the book it's an excellent book on how to actually build infrastructure in another country all the opportunities challenges the racial issues the cultural issues the financing issues the corruption issues everything comes out in that book so that's one book i strongly recommend the second book i recommend is one by professor jeffrey sachs of columbia university called the ages of globalization so that's uh, puts in perspective the role of asia so asia plays a big role in that book and he basically thesis is this is going to be the asian century for these 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 reasons and this is how it will happen under different scenarios and you know so us policy plays a big role in that as well so that's the second book uh, that i would recommend and uh, third i would recommend any book that deals with the history of uh, of the disputes of of the of the of asia the land disputes so there are several ones with, you know i might recommend uh, a report that uh, I wrote on called maritime issues of the east and south china seas you can go on the rand website and download it for free so it's called maritime issues of the east and south china seas so these are the three i would recommend okay so thank you so much sir for taking your time uh, and coming uh, on the show it's a monday morning so you might have work but thank you so much for taking your time and coming on the show thank you ratnadeep pleasure on my side as well